Hello and welcome to the Design for Additive Manufacturing with Mark Forge. Uh, having a good time this morning and excited to, uh, to be your host. So uh, my name is Nate Sampson. I'm a senior strategic application engineer uh, with Mark Forge. Been here for about three and a half years. I'm located in the, uh, the Washington, D.C. area. I got a mechanical engineering background. Um, and prior to Mark Forge, I've got some experience in uh, manufacturing in automotive power generation and aviation uh hobbies i uh, play a lot of soccer and uh, also pretty big into 3d printing uh, i've got a couple of hobbyist machines um, as well as some r forge machines at my home so uh let's get into uh an, an outline here of what we're going to be going over today so what is dfan right and why is it important and specifically, what is the Mark Forge recommended DFAM process? All right, there's a lot of technical considerations to take into consideration, uh, but when you do so, you're really going to help drive additive and uh, maximize what you're going to be getting out of the, uh, the process. And we'll be doing some uh, work throughs, uh, DFAMing some different parts, uh, so you can get an understanding of how to do so yourself. All right, what manufacturing processes produce these parts? So I'm going to show you uh, a couple of examples here. And uh, we'll go through, usually this is a little bit of an interactive session, but considering this is a webinar, you can kind of play along at home. Um, so I'll start identifying here. We've got a, a crankshaft. So think about how this is produced, uh, what processes, what manufacturing processes are used here uh, to make this part. So we got casting, forging, turning um, to produce a, a part like that. Next up, we've got these plastic bins produced in large quantities here. Injection molding, a uh, big, great process for producing these. Got some couplings. Got some turning, or thread milling, machining. And last up, we've got some lag screws. Screws to die casting, thread rolling, thread cutting. So a uh, big takeaway to kind of start off here, right? What do all these parts have in common? They're all designed for a specific manufacturing process. So we didn't just uh, produce these uh, or design these to be produced in, in any way, or multiple different processes, right? It's designed for a specific manufacturing process. So in turn, right, the best 3D printed parts are designed for the 3D printing process. Right? Very, very important here. So that's what we're going to be driving towards. So design for manufacturing. So this is kind of a broad uh, term, been used for a long time designing something with the intent of manufacturing with a certain process, right? Something that can be produced easily on the manufacturing floor with the equipment that you have available. So different methods can include injection molding, machining, stamping, welding, right? These processes have been around for quite a long time and uh, in industry, people have been designing for those processes specifically. They work very well. So taking you a step uh, more specifically towards additive, right? Design for additive manufacturing or DFAM, right? Being uh, very uh, prescriptive in your design uh, with the additive process in mind, right? We're not subtracting, uh, we're not molding, we're creating via additive. And to get even more specific, the Mark Forge additive manufacturing. So the, the uniqueness of the Mark Forge platform with the continuous fiber reinforcement CFR or the Atom atomic diffusion added manufacturing process on our metal side. Uh, taking those specific technologies into consideration is key in the design process, um, but can obviously also be applied to other technologies like binder jetting, SLA or SLS. So we'll level set here on what is 3D printing, right? 3D printing is uh, extruding material, C creating a part layer by layer. Um, our specific technology extrudes a thermoplastic through a hot nozzle onto a build plate. 
right? Layer on top of layer to produce your geometry. Uh, that was sped up, obviously. Be nice if it was that fast. Um, but that was a, a time lapse of a drone body being printed on our industrial uh, composite machine. So additive manufacturing, 3D printing, essentially they're the same thing, right? So additive manufacturing is more of a industry specific term, uh, more industrial term, but essentially, right, they're the same thing. They're producing a part uh, layer by layer. So the Mark Force design for additive framework. So we are going to take this three-step approach, very important to go through all three of these and not kind of skip through to the, the end solution, um, fully scoping your, your problem, creating a minimum viable product, and then optimizing. So employing DFAM uh, is very important. We see this a lot. Um, people take a, a part they already have, a design they already have, uh, throw it at the printer, and the results aren't always that great. Right? You're not going to get all the benefits of additive uh, without taking the design process into consideration. So you're, you're not going to be as efficient with your, your material, your printer time. Um, and I mean, sometimes the results, they're, they're just not great. They're not usable. So enabling innovation. Well, there's so much that can be done with additive that can't be done otherwise. For example, taking a, a four-part uh, assembly with a casting, uh, sheet metal stamping, some hardware, uh, and turning that into an individually uh, individual component produced with additive. Uh, being able to lightweight parts, our, our metal technology, we can do a low density infill. So replacing metal for metal with lower uh, with le uh, less weight, um, and also even more so, replacing metal parts with our high strain composite material. Uh, the geometric freedom you get with additive, right? You, you can produce these internal channels or internal geometries that can't be produced otherwise or wouldn't be produced otherwise because it'd be too uh, cost prohibitive. And customized low, low volume, you know, one-off solutions, uh, things like conformal work holding, uh, very simple for a 3D printer uh, to produce um, and will drive projects that may not have been necessary uh, without the implementation of additive. All right, the Marforge uh, technology here. So we start out with our composite series. Uh, so we've taken the traditional FFF or fused filament fabrication process and paired it with CFR, continuous fiber reinforcement that allows us to produce those uh, strong uh, you know, strength of aluminum components. Now the metal side, uh, came up with Atom, right? The atomic diffusion additive manufacturing process. Uh, taking what we, you know, all kind of know from that traditional FFF process and bringing metals into it. So understanding these processes, how they work, uh, is critical to start off in your design process. So these unique processes to Mark Forge do require some unique DFAM, and that's what we're going to be talking a lot about today. So things uh, that are all included in our wonderful design guide uh, cover, you know, fiber has uh, some limitations to it. It has a certain thickness. It can't be added um, everywhere and nor would you want to add it everywhere. So just understanding um, where to add it, uh, how to add it efficiently, um, achieving Z strength, all, all these things are covered uh, briefly in our design guide. So hop on over to our support page to uh, snag that after this uh, webinar to use as a reference. Oh, here is right the considerations and design guide for our Metal X platform for the Atom process. Uh, so things that you've learned from the composite side absolutely transition over, which makes the Metal X so uh, uh, easy to adopt um, with a couple additional uh, things to keep in mind. Uh, things about talking even more about supports, you know, understanding where your supports are being generated and uh, avoiding trap supports. Wash time, you know, maybe you're wondering why your wash times are so high. Um, you know, are you planning on post-processing your part, your part planning for that? So we're going to dive into, into all that here. So, uh, right, for the standard FFF process, things to consider when, when uh, producing your part. 
So uh, parts are created layer by layer and strength is going to be uh, better per layer versus across layers. So there's an inherent anisotropy um, across your, your, your layer lines. Uh, accommodating for threads. So we are very often asked, can you 3D print threads? Uh, you absolutely can, but there's so many other options as you can see there um, that could be a better fit for your solution. Uh, right, understanding support material and trying to minimize that. You know, we've got a, a door handle here that is utilizing just as much uh, material in the supports that is the part geometry. Um, so understanding how to orient your part for the best strength, surface finish, um, and you know, minimizing support material. Right, thin features. How, how are those going to print? Uh, surface finish. Uh, orienting your part to get the best surface finish, best dimensional accuracy. Um, adding abrasion resistance. You can see a quick example here of some dowel pins added to our like a standard plastic matrix material, getting properties of metal uh, with a, uh, a plastic-based part. All right, so again, the Mark Forge specific uh, considerations, right? That ability to add the continuous fiber um, where to add that fiber? Where does it make sense? We don't necessarily need to completely fill our part with fiber. Uh, we're going to add it where it's going to best resist the stresses in its environment. Uh, support removal, say specifically on the metal side, having a plan for removal. Uh, Markforge has that dual extrusion system with the ceramic to allow for easy, easy separation. Um, but just because the supports can separate doesn't mean they can physically be removed because there could potentially be part geometry holding them in place. Um, understanding the sintering process. You know, is the part going to sinter properly? All right, so we're going to dive into uh, some, some technical stuff here. All right, understanding support. So this is kind of like a 101. One of the first things to start thinking about design for additive is supports. So in that 3D printing process, right, you're starting out in, in your preferred CAD platform, you get your design down, you export that as an STL file, you bring it into our Iger platform, which will uh, which has our slicer that generates the code, which is sent to the, the 3D printer for production. So we're gonna focus here on the slicing aspect. This will help us understand uh, our support structures. So a uh, great analogy here, right? What is a slicer? How does it work? Think of a deli ham, right? You, you've got your, your, your big ham, your, your CAD file essentially, um, and the meat slicer is going to generate those 2D layers. So those discrete 2D layers, um, and then your part is produced, each of those layers, uh, one at a time, one on top of itself. So on the right here, you've got this kind of uh, representation of those discrete layers to reproduce your, your CAD file or your ham. So if you're familiar with the CNC world with CAM, right, you've got a, a, you know starting out with a, a block of uh, material and you're creating a tool path to remove material to create your final geometry. Well, in 3D printing, slicing does very much the same thing, only it's creating tool pathing to add matrix material, to add continuous fiber to produce your part uh, from a raw spool material rather than a, a block of material. So we're going to talk about how supports are, are being utilized and how to optimize them. So supports are, are and tend to be a, a necessary part of the process, um, right? A 3D print is created layer on top of layer. And all of a sudden, when you get to a portion or cantilever section of your part that has no structure under it, or right, has no previous layers under it, um, that's where supports come in. And those are automatically generated in our slicer. Um, and can be there to enable these overhangs or cantilever geometries. So, uh, as I said, supports can be necessary, but there's also, uh, you know, some lesser ideal things about them, right? So they are waste. They're, they're printed to be removed and thrown away. Uh, they are going to take additional time to, to print. Uh, so, you know, say you've got a, a part that adds an additional three hours. That could be uh, time difference between getting the part before you go home and having it the next morning uh, and the labor cost. So printing one-off parts may not be that big of a deal, 
Um, but as you start to get into uh, producing tens or hundreds of parts, uh, just a few minutes uh, of support removal per part can really add up. So key is here, it's a balance. You want to uh, be efficient with your cost and time, but also you need a successful print. So you don't necessarily need to eliminate all supports from everything, but where, where possible, um, you want to eliminate them. Right, so the overall theme here is to optimize your supports by minimizing their presence and maximizing their removability. So we've got a, a geometry here, right? Going through parts are built layer on top of layer, right? This simple geometry here, every layer built on top of one another, no overhangs, no cantilever features. So the general 45 degree rule, um, anything less than 45 degrees uh, will be produced without supports. Um, you know, this is a general statement, say for our onyx material, you know, our, our 17 4 stainless steel are most commonly used materials. Um, there are some other materials that have uh, an angle of 50 or, or 55. Um, so again, review our design guide to get the specifics for each material. So once you go past that, that 45 degrees supports will be required. Again, it will be automatically generated. Um, and that's seen here uh, in the, the green material there. So we can minimize our supports by reducing our overhangs to less than 45 degrees. So talking about uh, some lesser, less than ideal supported surfaces here. So high angle surfaces. So things greater than about 80 degrees. We're not going to have a great experience with parts that look like this, right? You're going to have some separation from your supports. Uh, you're going to have, you know, this is the underside of your, of your part. Uh, some of the pathings will be uh, separated. You've got a really beautiful part everywhere else. Then you've got a bit of an eyesore here. And also it's not going to be as accurate. Real simple uh, way to, to mitigate that, create a small flat on the bottom of your part. You know, maybe that has no uh, effect on the, the function of this part. Um, and now you've got a better looking part. It's going to be more successful. It's going to have a better service finish, dimensional accuracy, everything's going to go up. All right, chamfers. Chamfers are key uh, in removing supports from your de designs. So here's a cantilever feature. Maybe we've got two different diameters um, on this part here. Uh, traditional process of machining. We're going to turn one diameter and we're going to jump right to the next diameter. So that's all good for, for machining, but with additive, what we want to do is reduce the, or make a transition here um, to eliminate the need for that waste of uh, support material. So here we have that 45 degree chamfer, eliminating the supports. We're going to have a better service finish, uh, you know, quicker print time, uh, less post-processing, and it's designed for the process. So here's an example here. Right, we've got, again, the typical two, two different diameters with like a wrenching surface in the middle. Um, so this part, again, probably machined and turned to produce, all in good for that process. But to do a quick defam on this, here's what your new part could look like. Right? We've got a smooth transition with a chamfer. Uh, from one diameter to that wrenching surface, uh, no overhangs, no cantilever surfaces. This part's still going to function as intended um, and be much more efficient for the additive process. Right, here's another example of a gripper finger. Uh, we've got a, you know, what you commonly see, right, an undercut uh, on a, a high stress concentration surface uh, corner. So uh, this will require supports. There's a small area underneath that undercut that will require supports. Very small, but really un you know, unnecessary with a small design change, again, of adding a simple chamfer. So you're still uh, accomplishing that design intent of reducing stress. It's just being produced more efficiently on, the plat on an additive platform. All right, so breaking up supports. So uh, to say this, this part has to be um, right, produced on, on a 3D printer and it's going to need support structures, right? There's a lot of overhangs on the internal channels there. We've got that square cross section, we got the round cross section intersecting. 
And this is what your support structure would look like. You know, it's kind of like a rendering of that accordion style support structure that's being done on our composite machines. Um, even worse, if this were to be in metal, you would essentially have a T-shaped you know, piece of metal completely stuck inside your part. This is not ideal, right? Even on the composite side, you'd be able to get these out. You'd just be struggling. Um, you know, it may take you 10, 15 minutes to remove them. Maybe you'd have to get a drill out. Um, so with a little bit of forethought and knowledge, right? DFAM knowledge, very small, simple chamfers. So what that's going to do is create a small section that does not require supports. And that's going to create a separation between uh, that uh, square cross section and round cross section intersection. So we now have three separate structures that are all going to be very easily removed, right? We can push that blue section straight through and uh, that red and green section can be pulled out uh, axially. So very simple change, um, making your life that much easier on the back end. All right, let's talk about incorporating hardware, off the shelf hardware into your composite parts. So first up, we can start with reinforcing your holes with bushings. So instances where you'd wanna use a bushing, or if you've got uh, some low speed rotary motion, give, you can get a really nice uh, bearing surface from these. Um, it's going to reinforce that hole, it's gonna keep it uh, round and it's going to prevent wear. Um, can also improve uh, compressive loads, right? It's going to distribute compressive loads uh, throughout the part or potentially even take all of the compressive loads uh, depending on how it's installed. So there's a cross section of that part and how would you bring them together? All right, improving abrasion resistance. So first off, we've got some dowel pins. We kind of saw this example earlier. We've got some composite gripper fingers here that would probably get chewed up within a, within a shift, right? We've got a, a pretty rough surface to deal with here. We've got threads on the inside of this pipe coupling here. Um, the composite just wouldn't hold up. So rather than saying, you know, we can't do this with our composite machine, a couple dollars worth of da simple dowel pins, right? Design that into your, your CAD model, print it with the cavities, and after the fact, you can install these dowel pins, and now you've got a, a very abrasive and even replaceable wear surface um, to enable this application. And dowel pins are great to use on radiuses, right? Design them in um, at the tangent point of, of, your, uh, of your part. So if you're dealing with flat surfaces, uh, these shaft keys are, are a great way to, to get a, a great wear resistant surface, metal-like properties. Um, from your composite parts and they're low cost. You can cut them to size and uh, grip flat surfaces with the, the strength and uh, temperature resistance of metal. All right, thin pillars. So uh, as we talked how our parts are being produced, right? Layer by layer, you got a zoomed in section here uh, looking at all these red layers. So um, if any of you have held a, a 3D printed part or worked with a 3D printed part and it's failed, a lot of times your part's going to fail across the Z layers. That is the, the weakest port part of your, of your print. Um, and especially with the Mark IV CFR process, the arm of this part could be completely reinforced with carbon fiber. Right? We can get strength of aluminum out of the, you know, that, uh, the bend there, the arm of the structure, but that pillar is going to be significantly weaker. But again, there, there's no need to say, hey, we can't do this. We're not going to get good Z strength. So we can't print this part. Simple DFAM, design in a through pole that will accept a dowel pin. Now you've got the strength of steel in this pillar being locked into the continuous fiber reinforcement of the rest of the arm. And you've got an extremely robust metal replacement part here. All right, talking about threads again. So again, threads are very common uh, in, in components. We're asked about them a lot. So you have lots of different options here. So from the right, you've got uh, just a simple printed or, or hand tapped thread. We've got helicoil coming up next. We've got a hex nut, a square nut, and then finally the heat set insert. So as we go 
from right to left, we're going to increase our pull strength. So we're getting stronger and stronger as we go left. So each one of these has, uh, you know, it's, it's benefits and um, you know negative sides. So start with the strongest here, right? Our heat set inserts. You're using a soldering iron to melt that into the part. There's some barbs on the outside that are going to help hold it in place. And all that melted plastic will fuse around them. So we're creating isotropic strength by melting all of those layers together around this insert. It is extremely strong and going to be, in general, your, your go-to uh, method for installing uh, threads. However, you have to get additional uh, equipment out. You got to heat up the soldering iron. You have to have access to that, that hole, that printed hole to add that heat set insert into. So it's not going to be possible for all applications. Uh, so including uh, nuts in your design. So really low cost, obviously very durable and strong. Um, you can pause your print, drop them in and resume. So they can be completely embedded in your part, impossible to lose, right? As you, potentially your parts being um, assembled and disassembled often uh, by in, uh, embedding it in your part, it's not going to get dropped on the floor in that process. Uh, but just by designing in uh, them to be captive, you don't have to have a wrench on that nut to, to install the bolt into it. Um, but again, if you're pausing a print, you need to be around to do that. So if your pause is designed in for overnight while you're not at work or not at your printer, um, that's not ideal. Um, but designing in uh, just a cavity to hold the nut to be installed after uh, could be a simpler way to, to in, implement these. All right, helical inserts. So these are going to give you that next level of wear resistance over uh, a plastic thread. Um, they're not going to give you a whole lot of additional strength, however, um, but they do have a very slim cross-sectional profile. So if you've got a lot of other features on your part that are, are near your threaded hole and you don't have a lot of plastic uh, cross-section to melt or to add a nut to, then this could be a great choice for you. And lastly, right, printed threads. So you absolutely can print threads but typically you're not going to want to. They're not going to be nearly as strong as any of the other options we covered. Um, they could be great for a mock-up part, right? You just finished your first draft of CAD. Let's print the part out. Let's make sure it fits into the, uh, the application. Let's get our hardware installed, um, but it's not gonna hold up over time uh, with, with you know, heavy, heavy stress. All right, so that, that was a talk on our composites. Uh, let's talk a little bit more specifically about our metal X and the atom process. So this is a three-step process, right? We need to print, wash, and center for producing metal parts. Each one of them has specific design uh, considerations. So we will start out with uh, designing for the printing process. So we want to maximize our bed contact, keep the, the center of mass as low as possible. And for example, holes don't need to be round. Uh, we're not using uh, drill bits to, to make holes on a 3D printer. So by tear dropping them or peaking the roof of your, your, your through hole, it will now be produced more efficiently without supports um, and a better surface finish. Adding chamfers. Right. We, are, we already covered that. Very important on the, the metal platform. Uh, things to consider for the wash process. So the, over, the, the thickest part, uh, thickest geometry of your part is going to drive that wash time. So if you want to be more efficient, you can shell your parts, uh, maybe get more of a, uh, a uniform uh, part thickness uh, to drive that wash time down. All right, designing for sintering, all right, the last step of the process. So we're going to print and center in the same orientation. So you can see uh, an impeller here on a raft, right? That raft is printed first with the impeller on top of it. That needs to go in the same orientation for the center. All right, and, and think of your parts as they go into the furnace as uh, like a sand castle, right? Just because something was printed, it's got a bunch of tall overhanging features, uh, maybe they've been unsupported because you, you've met the design requirements for unsupported. 
um, but they're not uh, going to be a good fit for uh, the sintering process because uh, overhanging masses. So understanding that is important as well. Other simple things like adding a small chamfer to the bottom edges during that sintering process, there can be some small splaying that happens. All right, so we're going to grab a specific application here and go through the uh, the DFAM process. We're looking at CNC tube bending, so that tool right in the middle there, right along the uh, the, road, the the center axis, is what we're going to be taking a look at. So. Here's our three-step process. We're gonna fully scope the problem. We're gonna create an MVP and then optimize our design for additive. All right, identify core functionality of our part, right? What do we know? Uh, so we need, we need to bend three quarter inch steel tubing and uh, the die is going to see various internal loads, you know, pretty significant ones, you know, bending steel tubing uh, with the composite part. Uh, the radius of that bent tube must be an inch and a half, right? That's critical. The, this tool needs to produce a good end product. Um, and we're saying our die needs to last for 10 cycles. We want to produce uh, a prototype run of 10 parts of our, our tubing, verify we've got our design right, um, you know, before uh, we, we move forward with our production process. So we're going to talk about the applied forces here. We've got some, again, pretty significant compressive forces uh, from the tube being wrapped around this die. You can see they're highlighted with the arrows. Uh, here's a cross-section uh, cross view of our, our die and those compressive forces and how they're being distributed throughout the part. We've also got uh, torque. So there are these uh, machine keys that are turning the die um, to uh, get the bent structure of the tube. All right, first pass MVP CAD model here. So this is how the part would be produced um, traditionally, CNC, or likely out of a, a hardened tool steel. But right, we're going to be printing this, we're producing this with additive. So we got to take uh, take some consideration into that. So we brought this file into Iger, our slicing platform, and play around with a couple orientations here. Let's let's uh, take a look at this vertical orientation. So you can see the print bed there, uh, and what is the bottom surface. And you can already start to think about uh, this parts being built right layer by layer. What do those discrete layers look like? How are they going to create your part? Where's the strength um, you know, in that XY plane? Um, so here's highlighting uh, the support structures that would be generated for this geometry or for this orientation. Right there highlighted in purple. So what we are you know, kind of take away thoughts of this, uh, this orientation here. Uh, we're not going to really be able to effectively path fiber in our part with this orientation, right? We're, we're talking about needing to make a very strong part. So, so that's, that's a, a pretty big negative. However, the shear stresses um, are not going to be applied across the layer lines, right, for separation. So that's, that's great. We're not going to see that, that Z layer weakness with a lot of the, the stresses that we were getting on this part. Um, but another critical thing to think about is the surface finish of the uh, surface that mates with the tube, right? That tube is our end product. We want to make sure that we have a nice smooth surface for that tube to ride along. Um, so surface finish of that could be key and it's going to be a bit stair-stepped along that top radius. All right, let's look at another orientation here. We'll lay it on its side and talk about the, the benefits and negatives of that. So here's the support structure. A little bit more supports required for this orientation. Uh, so the shear forces on this are actually going to be in both scenarios here, right? From the tube and from the machine keys, going to be separating our layers. And that is not ideal, right? That is the weakest, weakest part uh, of our, our printed piece here. 
Um, however, we are going to get better resolution on this, right? We've got uh, the you know center of axis, right, is, in, is aligned in our Z, Z direction. So that's going to give us uh, some better resolution on that central through hole, um, as well as the surface the tube is going to be riding on. So there's always bal a balancing act here, kind of like how we talked with supports. Um, there's always going to be a balancing act of, of the orientation that you're going to choose. So let's talk about how we further did revise our design right, to specifically be produced on an additive platform. So we're going to choose this, this uh, orientation here to move forward with. You can already kind of see a bit of a sneak peek here. There's some uh, pockets generated in this design um, that will make this successful uh, to be produced on our additive platform. So again, the things that we're considering during this uh, design stage here is we got to resist the compression from the tube around the perimeter of the part, uh, resist the shear forces from the machine keys, and also right, maintain that nice surface finish from the, con uh, the, the tube that's contacting the part. All right, so first thing to overcome, right, that Z layer weakness. So that uh, tube is going to want to split this part right in half, and that is not good. But fortunately, the very easy way to accommodate that, so I've designed in uh, these cavities for captive nuts um, and through bolts. So essentially what that's going to do is compress our Z layers together and give us a strength of steel across that. So we've gone from the weakest part, uh, weak, weakest area of our part to essentially the strongest part very quickly, a couple dollars of off-the-shelf hardware. Uh, we've designed in uh, these hex cavities for the nuts. Uh, that way it will keep them flush uh, and not interfere with the, uh, the rest of the, the tooling assembly. All right, so we've got the shear stress from the machine keys. So we can add in cavities for key stock. So square metal stock can be added just like we saw in those gripper fingers earlier. Um, these are going to be uh, inserted again after the print and we'll distribute the shear load from the machine keys turning this tool across all the layers. So we won't have the issue of uh, our soft matrix material deforming um, or layer separation. Um, and lastly, we are going to have, you know, as we continue to tackle um, our, our major kind of stress points, you start to get into the, the areas which weren't necessarily a major concern at first, but may come up uh, maybe through potential iterations. And there's going to be a lot of stress on this center post here. So it'd be a great idea uh, to cover um, uh, to cover ourselves and in, uh, design in a bushing, right? We already kind of talked about bushings. Um, great for like low velocity rotation um, and distributing compressive forces. So we're going to uh, install one of those here to, to keep that central pivot point uh, from wearing, keep it nice and round and prevent deformation. And here's the beautiful finished part. Um, we've got our, our key stock, we've got our through bolts, and we've got our bushing in place. Uh, so this is a very good looking part. This is going to give you a, a great first pass um, at, at, uh, at trialing this part. Maybe we didn't quite think of everything, but we've, we've specifically uh, designed this to be produced on our composite machine um, to have the properties that are required to, uh, to be successful. One of my favorite applications to talk about there. So one last thing. So uh, we've covered quite a bit of content here. Hopefully we've got the, you know, the wheels are turning. You're starting to think outside the box a bit. Um, and this one tends to kind of really wow people and further think what is possible with additive. So metal threads, and let's say we're often asked about producing uh, threads on our printers. And we can do them both on composites, which we talked about pretty in depth so far, um, and on metals as well, right? The parts are produced the same way, so you absolutely can 3D print metal threads. So to further be efficient with that threading process, we've got a couple different options here to go over. So here's just a simple block um, that has uh, 
we have four different styles of, of tap threads here in our design. So starting on the left, we have traditional tap thread, you know, just like you'd produce with a, a drill and a tap. Uh, the next two are partially threaded uh, with some nice support structure uh, interface, um, you know, interface geometries. So all of these you know, or sorry, producing a, a, a hole in the XY plane will require supports, um, you know, if you're keeping the hole round. So those center two are still round, they will still require supports, but the support structures will be generated on a nice smooth surface. So we've essentially filled in the support or filled in the threads um, for option two, then option three, we've removed the threads. Um, and then finally, remember that teardrop hole, uh, idea we've been talking about, right? We're not using drills to produce our, our holes on our 3D printers. So the fact of just adding a peaked roof uh, could create an interesting tapped hole and no supports will be required for that version. So here's uh, a view of our part in Iger. First on the left, right, our standard tapped hole, we have a whole bunch of small individual chunks of support um, that you're seeing there in purple. Uh, the orange, the slight orange there you're seeing is that ceramic release, right? That's what's gonna allow you to remove those metal supports from your metal part. Um, those, uh, that first option there is going to be a bit more difficult to remove your, you know, 20 or so small individual pieces of supports. It's also not gonna give you the best surface finish, uh, right? If you think of just a, a regular hole uh, printed in the XY direction, the support, supported surfaces aren't nearly as nice as unsupported surfaces, right? The ones that don't require it. But then adding threads to that just makes it more complicated. So the next two have one individual chunk of support material uh, that is not touching any threads. Um, and then the last one, obviously, right? Printing without supports, uh, which is a very unique design. So this is how the part looks actually printed. And here it is with supports removed, or at least some of the supports removed. So we've got a couple chunks here on option one there, the traditional drilled and tapped style design. Um, not a great experience. Um, the, the surface finish isn't going to be as nice. You're probably still going to want to uh, chase that with, a, with tap. Um, the next one, the support structure removed very easily in one piece. Um, and now that can be chased with a tap to create the full thread engagement um, on the top and bottom. Uh, option number three here, uh, that support structure is removed and immediately ready to be used, right? The threads are functional and ready to go. You have lost some thread engagement, but thinking about increasing the bolt size, increasing the threading thread length uh, to get the, the strength that you need from that design. Um, and lastly, right, those uh, teardrop shaped threads or teardrop hole with threads um, was ready to go right out of the furnace. And uh, again, you are losing a bit of thread engagement, but I think that can be accommodated um, as previously mentioned. So again, ways to think outside the box on how to produce parts with additive. All right, thank you so much for your time. Um, I really enjoyed talking about this topic and uh, uh, we will open up for some questions here. So I believe there's a QA and a uh, box where you can submit some questions. I'll start reviewing them uh, and see if I can pro provide some great answers here. All right, got a question here on the uh, bolts, pins, bushings, right? They're great for increasing strength, but are they prone to corrosion inside? Um, so on the composite side, which is typically where you're adding um, those components, you're definitely going to want to consider the material choice for those for that hardware based on your application. Um, the matrix material you're likely mating that with is our onyx, right? Nylon based with carbon fiber. Um, typically not going to have any issues with uh, corrosion uh, with, co with common metal inserts. All right. Would the partial threads be able to hold similar strength to a full threaded tapped hole? I'd say the answer is definitely no. Right, and that's where I kind of covered, you're gonna to want to potentially increase uh, you know, uh, your bolt size, maybe increase the depth of your tapped hole 
um, to get the proper strength um, and threat engagement. All, all things to consider, right? We're just adding tools to your toolbox to understand um, what's possible. Potentially, uh, you, you do want to design your part, say on the metal platform, uh, keep it traditional. You absolutely can do that. All right, is there an option to program a print pause already in Iger? Or do you need to be at the printer and pause when it's required? So it absolutely does. So on the internal view of your part, um, again, on the composite side, you can design in a pause. So in the 2D view, you choose a specific layer you want it to pause at, right, right where that internal cavity is about to get capped off. Uh, right, It will pause. Um, and if you're utilizing our online version, you'll even get an email uh, you know, reminding you to stop by the printer, drop in your hardware. It can be nuts for, for threads. It can be sensors. It can be magnets. Um, as long as what you're dropping in sits below the current layer, right? Once you put that part in, the nozzle is going to come across right over the top of that. So it needs to be completely submerged below the current layer. All right. Is there any limitation to the direction of carbon reinforcement? Can it go in multiple directions? So again, our parts are produced layer by layer. And I know we really didn't get into the uh, real specifics of carbon fiber reinforcement. We've, we've done, we've created other content on that, um, but it can be, per, be added to your part in the X, Y plane. So you're gonna wanna design your part and you wanna orient your part on the print bed based on that. So you can get the carbon fiber reinforcement in the direction that you need it. Uh, say, for example, if you need it to, if you ideally would need it to go in the X, Y and Z direction, um, right? That's not something that is possible, but the DFAN techniques that we learned today, you can absolutely increase the strength in Z uh, with things like dowel pins. All right, different types of metals that we can print on our Metal X platform. 17-4 uh, stainless steel, H13, A2, and D2 tool steel, uh, Inconel 625, and pure copper. Um, it is capable of doing other materials. Uh, we do have an active R&D group on that. Um, but the materials I covered are what are available today. All right, it's a question on the uh, that last metal DFAM threads part. Uh, the second and third positions. So the second and third positions did differ from the first, right? The first, those support structures are tall, thin structures. Um, they weren't being produced in the X, Y direction, right? They're tall, thin, and Z. Um, basically a thin structure in between each thread. Think of it that way. Um, it is much easier to remove a solid piece, uh, either with a pair of pliers, or if it is a through hole, you can use a simple punch to tap it through. Um, one large chunk is easier than um, having to dig into a hole with a pair of tweezers um, to remove small individual pieces. All right, how many layers would you recommend to leave above uh, where you're gonna drop in a part mid print to avoid a collision? So depending on uh, how accurate your part is that you're dropping in, right? Sometimes if you're getting low cost, uh, maybe washers or nuts, they're not gonna be very consistent in size. So it's probably good to double check that. Um, but leaving, leaving a layer uh, could definitely be um, be a, a good idea to be a bit cautious there uh, to prevent collision. But the uh, if your cavity is designed properly, um, you you should have uh, you know properly sized cavity to drop in your part. Um, also take into consideration the layer height that you've chosen. So if you design a cavity for a very specific dimension, um, and say you were producing a part with a 250 micron layer height, uh, that is the just you know. That the part can't be more the the cavity can't be more accurate than the layer height chosen. However, you could be printing all the way down to fifty micron layer height and be very precise with your cavity height. All right. In general, uh, the max overhang angle for the Metal X system uh, is forty five degrees. You say that is uh, a, a standard for say our seventeen four material. Materials like copper and Inconel do require. Uh, a bit more conservative at 50 degrees. Again, that is included in our design guide. Uh, please hop on our support page and download those for your reference. 
All right. Would it be possible to wrap the carbon reinforcement around a pinhole? So yes, absolutely. You, you should be using the carbon fiber, the continuous carbon fiber reinforcement uh, to reinforce those critical features, those, those areas where you need the additional strength. Um, so there are uh, limitations to that, right? The XY thickness of that fiber when it's laid down, um, as well as minimum length. All these things are covered in a design guide um, to, to talk about minimum features, uh, minimum fiber length, thing, length, things like that. So again, strongly recommend that, that as a guide. All right, if there is a power outage during printing, can printing be continued from the same position once power is restored? So we do get this question a lot, um, and the answer is no. And the reason for that being uh, heavily based on security. So when power is cut from the printers, whether intentionally uh, by the user via the power cord or the power button, um, or from an unexpected uh, power interruption, um, all the, the all of your, your data, your part data uh, has been removed. So um, say for example, if uh, someone were to walk away with the machine, um, they would be walking away with your tech data, which is not great. Um, so that is why that is uh, uh, why we, we are unable to restore after uh, power being restored. However, one of the first times uh, our users lose a print based on a power outage, uh, they are quick to jump to buying uh, a UPS, an uninterrupted power supply. Um, highly recommended. Uh, the cost of those tends to be just a little, you know, right around the same price uh, as the, the, pr the print that you just lost potentially. So be a good idea to, to spec those out um, for your printer or printers. All right, looking like the questions are coming to a close here. Uh, yes, the design guide uh, is on our website. Um, please have a look at that. Say, save a save a copy for your reference whenever you're uh, designing in CAD. It's great to have that handy. All right, considerations regarding compliant mechanisms. So we have just released uh, uh, a material called TPU. Um, it is flexible and great for producing compliant parts. And another plug for our design guide, there is a section at the end that goes over uh, design techniques. You know, it's very brief, um, but it does you know, kind of get the wheels turning again of how to produce compliant parts with that flexible material. All right, so I think that about wraps it up here. Um, again, thank you very much for your time. Um, it was a pleasure speaking to you and good luck with your, your ventures with Additive and hope you can produce some awesome parts going forward. Thank you very much.